I uh, begin by welcoming all of you to the service this evening. It's good to see uh, a goodly number gathered this evening. We thank you for coming. And if you're a visitor, you're doubly welcome here. And also, we would uh, invite all of you to stay behind afterwards for some uh, refreshments in the church hall. I know the ladies have gone to some trouble in order to provide them. And uh, we do trust that uh, you'll be there in order to uh, help uh, clear them up. Uh, so that's uh, really the first announcement I want to make. The second one <clears throat> is with regard to the harvest gifts will be distributed to households, uh, to those who are housebound, sick and elderly, and those who are able to help with that and the dismantling of the uh, harvest uh, arrangements, uh, you're asked to come to the church here at 10 a.m. tomorrow morning. The other uh, announcements are found on the announcement sheet, just one that we didn't put on, but is, uh, I know it was mentioned this morning, uh, there'll be a committee meeting on Monday week. And then I would like to say a word of thanks to uh, all those who've been involved in uh, preparing for this day. Uh, for those who came in yesterday, but a goodly number of people came yesterday in order to uh, decorate the church so tastefully, and we thank you for doing that. We thank Roberta for uh, training the choir. We thank the choir for coming to their various practices and we look forward to their ministry uh, later on in the service. Also, uh, a very special word of welcome this evening to Dr. Sam Mahoney, the moderator of the General Assembly, and to his wife, Karen. Uh, we thank them for coming in their very busy, busy schedule. Uh, they were earlier on in one of the other churches in the presbytery uh, this morning, and it's good that they've been able to stay and conduct the evening service here tonight, so we welcome you, Dr. Mahoney, very much indeed, and we I say, pray that God would bless you as you come into our uh, midst here this evening. The choir are now going to lead us in their intro. <laughs> Now we continue to praise God as we join together in the words of that great harvest hymn, We Plough the Fields and Scatter.
Well, good evening, everyone. It's uh, lovely to be with you here in Bush Mills, in your beautiful building, and in this uh, well-heated building as well. I see we're all nice and warm uh, this evening. I took a walk this morning uh, along the Strand in Bally Castle, which is my home, and I rarely get the chance to do that. Um, and as we pray, uh, we're going to give thanks to God for his great creation as we've been singing. Uh, so let's just uh, bow our heads. Let's talk to God now as we adore him and confess our sins. Let's pray. Father, we thank you that you are indeed a brilliant creator. And we thank you that you have made everything wonderful. Not just as we look at these tokens of all that you have given us uh, in front of us in this church this evening, uh, but also in nature outside. For me this morning, it was just seeing the beauty of the waves, to see how they are so perfectly formed because the moon is in the right place, not too far away, not too close, just dragging by gravity that water. Father, it is a remarkable thing, a cleansing thing, a repetitive thing, but it is beautiful to watch. And it speaks to us of who you are, it speaks to us of your detail of creation. It speaks to us of your power in creation. And Father, we thank you that you are a God who is worthy of our praise. And Father, I saw some birds there. I think they were oyster catchers. They were making this beautiful sound. They had their long beaks, orange, black and white. And again, it was just a marvel of creation and we thank you for it. And Father, even as we stand and think about that creation, we are humbled. We recognize that we are powerless. And we recognize also that we are not worthy. That there's something within us that, that realizes that we don't fit, as it were. We fall short of the glory of God. And Father, so we thank you that you have been so kind to us to give us your son, the Lord Jesus, and to send him to earth that we might see you more perfectly. And Father, we thank you for Jesus. We thank you for the life that he lived, a life that was wonderful in every aspect. We thank you for the words that he spoke, which were gentle when they needed to be, profound always, truthful always. We thank you that he had power to heal and to transform lives with a touch or with his voice. And Father, we thank you just for his love that kept him walking towards Jerusalem, that brought him ultimately to the cross and to dying on that cross. Father, we thank you for the beauty and the power and the deep love and grace that we see in the Lord Jesus. And again, we're humbled. We recognize that we do not measure up. We recognize that we fall short. We recognize that we are not as we should be. We don't think as we should. We don't act as we should. We're often afraid. We're often scared. And Father, even in our hearts, we rebel. And we don't follow your word. We simply confess before you this, this evening. And we thank you, Father, for that opportunity to confess our sins, to just simply say that we're sorry that we haven't measured up. And Father, we thank you for the truth that if we confess our sins, you are faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to purify us from all unrighteousness. So, Father, we enter into your presence today in this holy place, uh, in the wonder of creation, in the wonder of the gospel. And we pray that in all that we do, we thank you for the gifts that will be displayed today of music and of, mu and, and of singing. And uh, Father, we pray that we might listen carefully to what your word says. And we thank you that you want to meet with us, that you desire to speak to us, you desire for us to listen. And I pray that we will do that this evening and that, Lord, that you will be with us in this very special harvest service. So we pray these things and ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, we're going to uh, have a reading. Our reading is from the Gospel of Luke, 
Um, I don't know if you have Bibles there, but if you have, it'd be good to open it up and have a look at it. It's always good to make sure that the minister doesn't say anything that he shouldn't be saying and that you can check it out on those as well. So Luke, of course, was a doctor uh, and he wrote an accurate account of the life of the Lord Jesus. And so he's describing here one of his parables, the parable of the sower, which I'm sure that you know well. So that's Luke chapter 8 and beginning at verse 1. Um, there's an introduction really about uh, the people that followed him and then we get into the parable. So this is God's word. After this, Jesus traveled about from one town and village to another, proclaiming the good news of the kingdom of God. The twelve were with him, and also some women who had been cured of evil spirits and diseases. Mary called Magdalene, from whom seven demons had come out. Joanna, the wife of Shusa, the manager of Herod's household, Susanna, and many others. These women were helping to support them out of their own means. And while a large crowd was gathering, the people were coming to Jesus from town after town. He told this parable. A farmer went out to sow his seed. As he was scattering the seed, some fell along the path. It was trampled on, and the birds of the air ate it up. Some fell on rock, and when it came up, the plants withered because they had no moisture. Other seed fell among thorns, which grew up with it and choked the plants. And still other seed fell on good soil. It came up and yielded a crop, a hundred times more than was sown. And then he said this, he called out, he who has ears to hear, let him hear. His disciples asked him what this parable meant. He said, the knowledge of the secrets of the kingdom of God has been given to you, but to others I speak in parables, so that though seeing, they may not see, though hearing, they may not understand. This is the meaning of the parable. The seed is the word of God. Those along the path are the ones who hear, and then the devil comes and takes away the word from their hearts, so that they may not believe and be saved. Those on the rock are the ones who receive the word with joy when they hear it, but they have no root. They believe for a while, but in the time of testing, they fall away. The seed that fell among thorns stands for those who hear, but as they go on their way, they are choked by life's worries, riches, and pleasures, and they do not mature. But the seed on good soil stands for those with a noble and good heart who hear the word, retain it and by persevering, produce a crop. And we do thank God for his word for each of us this evening. Amen. Well, the choir are now going to lead us in singing, Bless the Lord, O My Soul.
Thank you, choir. Well, let us all stand and praise God in these great words. Great is thy faithfulness. Let's stand to praise God. Well, we're going to talk to God again in prayer. We're going to pray for others at this time and uh, going to pray for the situation in Israel and Gaza. Um, and um, I suppose one of the, the thoughts that I've been having about this is, is lament. Uh, and lament is where we are sorry um, with a passion uh, because of the trauma and the sad things that we see in the world. Uh, and so I think if we do that, then we don't tend to take sides, but we just lament before God the reality of the situation, though our sympathies may lie in one side or the other. So let's pray and ask God to really intercede in these areas. Father, as we were singing, great is thy faithfulness, and I knew that I was going to pray here, I, I was kind of conflicted a bit because... Uh, Lord, it's great, isn't it, being here 
What a privilege to come into this beautiful building to have the peace and security, know that no one uh, really hassles us coming to worship. In fact, they may commend us to do so. Um, to have this facility here, to be able to, to know that we can just be ourselves and to praise you. And yet, Father, when we think of different parts of the world, we recognize that they are in turmoil. And at this moment in time, our eyes are fixed on the war in Israel and Gaza, and the war in Ukraine with the Russians. And, Father, the, the Psalms lament the brokenness of humanity, the sinfulness in the human heart. And Father, this evening, we want to lament the hatred in Israel and Gaza. We want to lament the hatred that allows one human being to kill another human being, to destroy every semblance of their lives, to desecrate their bodies, to destroy their homes, to take away everything that they've ever had, and to do it in the name of their God. Father, we lament that reality. And Father, we lament that this reality has been going on for centuries, for generations, and that the human heart is so depraved, so wicked, that it might want to go in that direction. And we know our own hearts. We know the sense that we have of revenge. We have a, a sense within us that we want to put it right, to cause them harm. And Father, we, we lament that we do not have love for our enemies, that we do not pray for those who persecute us, that we're not as you would have us be. And Father, we lament that there seems to be no hope. I do not see how this can change. I cannot see any other way but a great loss of life, the displacement of many people, and casualties on both sides. And Father, we do not know what you are doing. We do not understand why this should come about at this time and in such a brutal fashion. So, Father, we pray that as we lament, we simply come to you helpless and hopeless and needing you to do something wonderful and spectacular. So we remind ourselves that you are love. We remind ourselves that great is your faithfulness. We remind ourselves that you are a God of justice and that you are a God of peace. My peace I leave with you, not as the world gives, give I you. And so, Father, we do pray for peace in Israel, Gaza. We pray for peace in Ukraine. We pray, Father, for the situation there. We ask that you will, I suppose we want to see the aggressor weakened. We want to see justice done. We want to, yeah, just see the people of Russia have their voice. And Father, we pray that there might be resolution here where we see no resolution. So, Father, help us in our despair, as it were, in our lack of answers, to truly just be able to talk to you, as the psalmist say, to pour out our hearts to you. And, Father, as we move closer to home, we pray uh, for the PSNI at this time, a force under great pressure. We thank you, Father, for the appointment of uh, John Boucher. We pray that you will help him to uh, settle in quickly, to be able to make the right decisions to bring stability to the, the folks there. Father, I thank you for the good work that the policemen and policewomen of the PSNI do in very difficult circumstances, and particularly at this time where their security has been compromised and where it seems that everything is against them. We pray that you will make them wise in the operational decisions that they have to take. We pray that you will thwart the hands of evil men and women who would seek to destroy life and seek to destroy our society. And so, Father, we pray that they will know you and that, Father, that they will know your help. 
We thank you for the many Christians within that organization, particularly well, those as well in leadership. And we pray that you will help them to be able to do their job well, to keep morale high, and that, Father, that you will keep them safe. Father, we pray for this church. Father, we thank you for the ministries of the past. We pray that you will be with the Kirk session. Uh, we, think, uh, we thank you for Ian and for his uh, convenership here. We pray that you will give him wisdom as he leads. And Father, we pray that you will, uh, Lord, give again this church a vision for who you are and for what you want to do. Father, we pray that your call to the person of your choice will be clear and that, Father, that there will be a, a renewal that will come. And, Father, we need that in all of our churches. Father, I pray for those who have gathered today. We thank you for everybody here. You know our needs. And we just name those needs to you and we pray that you will answer them according to your great mercy and your grace. And, Father, we thank you again for this privilege of being able to take uh, our requests to you. And we give you all the praise. And we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, the choir are going to sing again and lead us in praise. Simple gifts of thanks. Thank you very much. Well, we're going to worship God as we give our offering to him now. Um, I don't know, if is this a special offering, Ian? Is it just, uh, so it's your harvest offering. So let us worship God as we give that offering to him now.
Well, before we come to hear God's word, we're going to sing again together. Uh, our praise is called for the fruits of his creation. So let's stand to sing. Well, folks, it is good to be with you this evening in Bush Mills, and I want to thank uh, the Reverend McNee or Ian for his very warm welcome, and for Anne for her hospitality before we arrived uh, with you uh, this evening. Um, as I said, I'm from Ballycastle, so it may be that some of you went to school with me in Ballycastle High School. If you did, you can talk to me later, um, and uh, that would be good to catch up in that way. Um, uh, and I bring you the greetings, of course, of the General Assembly. Um, uh, that is an honor that is mine to kind of represent, as it were, the whole of the PCI. Um, and even though you're on the North Antrim coast, uh, you're not forgotten by the folks in Church House. And you are part of something bigger. You are linked with my congregation, of course, in Adelaide Road in Dublin. Um, and the congregation that I served in, for example, in Fermoy in County Cork. Uh, which is a very long way away. Um, I used to say that when Ballycastle to Scotland is 14 miles and Ballycastle to Vermoy is 300 miles. And so the disconnect between one culture and another culture uh, is seen in that reality. But you are part of the Presbyterian Church in Ireland and so I bring you the greetings of the General Assembly uh, and in a sense I'm saying hello to you. You're welcome. You're part of us and we're glad that you are. And it's good to be here this evening. Um, yeah, I just want to kind of talk to you about my theme, uh, which is confident in Christ as well. Um, and I suppose maybe just to start that before we get going, um, one of the things that we notice in the world at the moment is that there is a lack of confidence in the church. So if you live in the Republic of Ireland and you're a priest and you're wearing a white top like mine, you would often take your collar off and you'd open up your collar and you would walk incognito uh, around the streets because nobody likes the priest. Nobody wants to be associated with the church. And we've lost confidence in the church. We're a bit like those who start off going to the gym and then just find that it's too hard. 
So because society doesn't like the church, we struggle a bit with saying, oh, I'm part of the church. So that we have lost confidence in the church. We, I think we've lost confidence in the word of God. I was at an event. Um, you get invited to strange things as the, uh, as the moderator. You know, Ian can say that as well. We were invited to the Egyptian embassy in Dublin, a collection of Arab leaders there. And what was interesting, because my background is medicine, I studied medicine, uh, is that the ambassador in Egypt, uh, for Egypt, was a doctor. Um, And he was really interesting, and he was was talking away about his country and the links with Ireland, and I was quite fascinated by it. And then he said this, he said, I'm a medical doctor, and I know that your brains can't take any more than five minutes, so I'm going to stop And isn't that what we often say, isn't it? We say that about sermons. It's a favorite topic. I hear it all the time. The minister, he was very long. Oh, he was so long. He was boring. You know, and we judge a sermon by its length or we, you know, we kind of think about those kind of things. So we've lost confidence that this word that you are hearing this evening is God speaking to you. That he wants you to hear something. The God who made those waves that I marveled at this morning. The God who designed those uh, oyster catchers with all their brilliance. He wants to speak to each one of you today and he's written it down. But we have lost confidence in it. We say people don't listen any longer. They can't bear 25 minutes or whatever. So we've lost confidence. And we've often lost confidence in ourselves, aren't we? We... You know, we don't see changes in our own lives. We don't see the effects of what we say we believe lived out in confidence. And so we're actually quite scared of being Christians in this world in all those reasons. But I suppose whenever I look at, uh, uh, when I look at the, the Bible, I, I see in Moses, this leader of Israel, he, he said, look, have confidence in God, have confidence in his word, do as he says and see what the blessing will be. There's a lovely passage in John chapter 6, isn't there, where, where Jesus is, is, you know, he's popular, but then people start saying, this is, these are the kind of things they said, this is a hard teaching. Jesus says, does this offend you? And verse 66, from this time, many of the disciples turned back and no longer followed him. So there was a choice to be made, wasn't there? Because the word of God was challenging them. And so what did the disciples say? The disciples said, or Jesus said, are you going to leave me too? And he said, but to whom will we go? You have the words of eternal life. So I want us to kind of rethink again that we might have confidence in God and confidence in his word. And that's really the theme of what I've been trying to say in all the, uh, the sermons that I've been doing. So we're going to look at this. This is a kind of new sermon for me. It's a bit over the place, but we'll see how we get on. If you do have Bibles, it would be lovely to have them open at uh, Luke chapter 8 and have a look at what's happening here. So you'll see in verse 4, I want to talk about the popularity of Jesus. It says that a large, a large crowd gathered to meet him from the surrounding towns. Why? Why are they coming? Well, firstly, he's an incredible teacher. He looks out at the fields and he's able to teach them about the word of God from this field. It's just an incredible reality. Of course, he is healing people. He's casting out demons. And his his fame, as it were, has gone before him. And he's such a good teacher that the people have come almost to this day conference, as it were, uh, held at the side of a mountain, And they have never gone home. They they don't want to go home. They're there in the evening time. The disciples realize uh, as well that they have been there all day. We saw that, of course, in the feeding of the 5,000. He was attractive to people. His message was a positive one. That's what he says here in verse 1. Proclaiming the good news of the kingdom of God. This is good news. It's about a kingdom. It's about a kingdom where God rules. That is the rule of Jesus in your heart. And whenever you see that people were flocking to Jesus, you see that he was a man of authority, of power, of truth, and of goodness. I wonder in your heart, do you think, yeah, that was, that's good, isn't it? Jesus is good. 
He is a good man. He is God. He's got great character. Uh, And if you compare that then to the leaders that we have in our society, for example, or politicians, or sports stars, or world leaders, or heads of banks, and business, isn't there a lack of integrity? You don't see that with Jesus. Isn't there a lack of service? You don't see that with Jesus. And wisdom, and you don't see that with Jesus. He is a great leader. We need to see it. And we're tempted to despair, aren't we, about the quality of leaders in our society. And Jesus is saying, I want to be your leader. I want you to follow me. And he wants us to share in the kingdom rule. He even says that in verse 10. He's about to teach us. Verse 10, he says, the knowledge of the secrets of the kingdom of God has been given to you. He's about to tell you something important. He's about to tell you the very secret of the kingdom of God. Are we listening? Do we want to hear it? Because the disciples did. Verse 9. The disciples asked him what this parable meant. What does it mean? I want to hear it. I want to know it. Is that how you come to church? Is that how you hear when you come to church in the mornings or in the evenings? Is that what you do when you read your Bibles at home? Are you saying, I want to hear from Jesus. I want to know what this means. I want to hear what you're saying to me. Because I believe that he who has ears to hear, let him hear. That's what we're here for. To hear what God will say. And that's how we're going to understand what this kingdom is like. So we're going to look at this now and we're going to just look at these different responses quite quickly, I hope. Um, of course, it's a, I don't need to explain to you. I assume that most of you are, have agricultural backgrounds that you understand farming, um, the different soil types. I do want to just start this off by saying in verse 11, it says this is the meaning of the parable. The seed is the word of God. So when we sing, we plow the fields and scatter the good seed upon the land, we're talking about the word of God. That's where we're going to be rooted in the scriptures of the Old and New Testament and in this parable itself. And yet we must show that interest and we must ask for help. What does this mean? And how do we do that? We pray. So let's pray. Let's ask God to speak to us this evening. Will you bow with me? Father, we thank you for this word We thank you for the knowledge of the secrets of the kingdom of God. We pray that you would help us to understand it. We pray that you will open it to us and that, Father, that it will transform our lives, that will bring us the knowledge of of the kingdom, it will bring us knowledge of Jesus, it will bring us into the kingdom if we're not already there. And that, Father, that you will build your people and build your church. And that, Father, that we will see you do a mighty thing in our day. Father, we know that our society needs it. We, need that, we know that our society is like a sheep without a shepherd. And they need this leader who is Jesus. And they need him to lead them through life. And I pray, Father, that you would help us to hear all that you want to say today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So firstly, you have the path. In Jesus' day, people walked around the outside of the field. And it became hard with the trampling of the people's feet and because of the sun that was obviously shining at the time. And for us, of course, it might still be the outside of the field occasionally. We don't uh, put the seed in there, as it were. And of course, you see the tractor tires and you might say that is where this is the hard ground. And so the seed falls in that path. Uh, It doesn't go down into the soil. The birds eat it. It doesn't germinate or grow and it's snatched away. And I suppose when I was thinking about this, then my first thought was, well, what pounds our hearts to make them hard? What has happened in your life that has made you struggle with accepting this word? I had a family member on my father's side, not my mother's side. Most of you might know my mother's side better, but my father's side, uh, both parents died when the children were young. 
and one of my uncles uh, didn't go to church and then he did start going to church but he didn't sing and I asked him why he wasn't singing and he said that when he was a young boy in Bally Castle that whenever his mom and dad died that he had said to God that he would never sing to him again and it was understandable isn't it because life had given him a hard deal his mom and dad had died too young his heart had been hardened by the difficulties of life that's often what happens isn't it harsh our circumstances are harsh and so the human the tendency of the human heart is to harden itself against those whom we think is responsible that is our natural direction and i think what was struck me about this is that's not primarily what it's saying here if you listen to this verse about the path it says those along the path verse 12 are the ones who hear and then the devil comes and takes away the word from their hearts so that they may not believe and be saved so yes we harden our hearts but it's the prompting of the devil who allows us to do that and if you are a normal person in this normal Western society, you're saying, Sam, what are you talking about? Why are you talking about the devil in this world? Isn't that a strange thing to do, to talk about the devil? People don't like you talking about the devil. But I want to say to you that Jesus believed in a personal being called Satan. He was created for worship, for God in heaven. Through pride, he sought to overthrow throw God, and he was banished from heaven, who rules, and he rules the world, and he seeks to take the word of God from our hearts by any means, usually by subtle means. And so every time that you sense that your heart is hardening or that you are questioning the word of God, you need to realize that that is someone who does not want you to believe. And you need to hear, well, I heard that in this sermon, and I hear that there is a devil who wants me to go in that direction, but that leads to death. And I want, to, I want life, and I want Jesus, and therefore I'm going to listen to what he says. And that's hard, folks. We have to repent of our hearts. We have to move in the other direction. And folks, if you do that, if you harden your heart, if you do not believe in him, then the consequences are tragic and serious and eternal. And if up to this point in life you have failed to listen to God, if you've made excuses, if you've drifted away, even because of the hardness of the circumstances of your life or because of the hostility of society, then you are, un you are under the influence of the devil. And he wants to destroy you. He, does want, he wants you not to listen to the word of God. And I plead with you to see this reality. See it in the hard ground. See it in the explanation that Jesus had given. And to repent and believe the goodness and the character of the work of Jesus and be saved. That is what he is saying to us today. And then we see secondly in the shallow or rocky soil, verse 13. He talks about the rocks, the one on the rock. Ballycastle people say rock. Belfast people say rock. I think that's what they say anyway, but there you go. But whenever I was, you might know that my dad, by the way, had a small farm in Ballycastle. It was a farm that was never worked until he got it and then he ploughed it up. And my heart was broken with stones. Can you imagine that? Me and my brother James lifting stones day in and day out. And my heart was broken. And then, of course, we'd lift these stones. And then he had this thing called a grubber. And he would go over it again. And there would be more stones come up. And then we'd lift them again, and then he'd get the disc car out, and he would bring it up, and there'd be more stones. And our hearts were broken because of stones. But we had to be lifted, didn't they? Why? Because grass does not grow on stone. Crops do not grow on stone. And we're not talking primarily about stones here, but shallow grounds, rocky ground, as it were, a layer of stone, probably. But you get the idea. The stone needs to be broken up. It needs to be removed. And here we see that what happens here is not that the seed doesn't go down, but it goes down a little bit. But then the, hard, the, the sun comes, as it were, the difficulties of life, almost like the same illustration. 
So when I went to Fermo uh, Clonmel, uh, it's the county town of Tipperary, um, and that's where I was living. I actually went there on All-Ireland Final Hurling Day, by the way, that's when I was ordained that weekend, and they had all the blue and gold out for the Tipperary hurling team, and they lost the final that year in 1997 to County Clare. But when I was there, we held Bible studies in the local hotel, and actually one of my neighbors came, a lovely lady that we got to know, and she described, I don't know if anybody's involved in the Gideons, but she discovered she had this little Gideon Bible, and she earthed it out, and she began to read it, and then she came to the Bible studies, and she came round to me in my house, just a few, just the next estate she was in, and she came around and she says, Sam, I've become a Christian. It's brilliant. It's wonderful. And I've discovered this Gideon Bible, and I'm really enjoying it, and it's great. And then she went back, and over the course of a couple of weeks, she told her husband, and she told her only daughter that she'd become a Christian. And they said, you're a fool. You shouldn't be a Christian. That's Protestant or whatever. I don't know what was said, to be honest. But she came back to me later on in a couple of weeks' time, and she said that she couldn't be a Christian any longer. And my heart was broken. She simply faded away. There was no root. I was deeply disappointed. And I've never forgotten her or the story since. That's what happens when we accept this word as it were, but we don't allow it to go down deep. Folks, I want to say to you that Christianity is not about an experience. It's not about having a high time of coming to a harvest service and singing good songs and then going away and forgetting about it. The Christianity is about knowing the word of God daily in your life and letting it go down deep. PCI is much smaller than before. Thousands have left us. Our young people are under enormous pressure. The temptations and options of alternatives to church are available and numerous and excessive, accessible. The shift in society has been mass massive and our message is made fun of and we're believed to be harmful for human flourishing. We are being tested. We will not survive in shallow soil. You will not survive on reading your Bible once a week. You will not survive on just coming to church once a week. If you want to thrive in this society, you must be convinced of the goodness of God. You must be convinced of the truth of this message. You must be convinced that this is the word of God and it is necessary for your life. It's necessary for our planet. It's necessary for our government. It's necessary for our teachers. It's necessary for life and for flourishing in hope and in death. If you want to understand suffering, if you want to understand all the good things that God has for us, and if you're not, you will simply fade away. That's what our young people need. They need to see us who love the Lord. They need to, people to talk to them and walk with them in this. And if you're a leader in the church or if you're a parent, you must find ways of walking with your young people and encourage them to allow the word of God to penetrate deeply. If it's shallow, the sun will burn it and you will not survive. And thirdly, we see the weeds, the thorny ground in verse 14. Again, I've said that Jesus is this brilliant storyteller. He is telling this idea of being choked by life's worries, riches, and pleasures. And that is a fantastic word picture. The root of the word worry means to choke. And I suppose as a medic, it's like being strangled, as it were. And it's a lovely metaphor, isn't it? It's a strong metaphor. You can see that. If I strangle somebody, I choke the life out of them. But of course, it works for the... Uh, reality of the uh, trees and things as well. So the Manson Adelaide Road in Dublin is actually quite large for a Dublin uh, thing, but I've actually cut down two trees or three trees since I've been there. A weeping willow has died uh, and my two silver birches have died, believe it or not. And the reason that they've died is because we have this massive big beech tree and we also have Leandi. Somebody planted Leandi at the back and they become so tall that they just suck all the water and all the light away from these other trees. And they've just slowly died over the years. That's the picture. Life slowly taken by a constant and severe pressure being applied. No light, no room, completing resources, 
and the seed simply stops growing and coming to maturity and fruitfulness. Folks, I've seen it with life's worries, isn't it? How many of us know people who are just crippled by life's worries? Who cannot, who do not seem to have the faith to believe that Jesus is good and that he will see them through these things. Who do not know the word of God well enough that they will bow the knee and pray, but who just constantly worry about things. And who have no uh, sort of sense, uh, young people who worry about exam results, Single people who worried about being married or not being married. Money and death. How many people are scared of death? What did COVID do for us whenever we were thinking about death? That's what happens in these life's worries. And again, we get choked. The word of God gets choked and we need to rediscover it and rediscover what we're doing. We could talk about career or sport and hobbies and holidays and travels. And really what we see here is that they don't mature. That's the sad thing, isn't it? If you're a doctor and you're seeing a child, and that child's two years old and they're not walking, you're worried. And if that child's three years old and they're not speaking, you're worried. What is it like when you see a Christian who's been a Christian for 10 or 20 years and you see very little evidence of maturity? Well, then you need to begin to ask, what has been choking them? What is more important in their life than the Lord? What is, what is going on in their lives? And it's something that we need to think hard about. And so, for example, if you are worried about death, what is our understanding about death? What does the Bible say happens to us when we die? What does the Bible say to us about the timing of our death? Where is our hope in death? How do we know these things? We know these things if we're prepared to read about them, if we're prepared to talk about them with other people. And God gives us promises, doesn't he? He tells us that the Bible that every day ordained for us is written in his book. He tells us that we do not grieve like other people because we have this hope. He tells us that because Jesus has died and rose again, that because we're in him by faith, that we have died and that we have risen, and that technically we are with him in heaven now. But we don't know that if we don't read. And we need to understand these things. And therefore, we're not mature. And if we're not mature, then we don't have anything to say to this world. And of course, that is a greater focus on the Lord Jesus, of course. We need to learn to pray again, isn't it? Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything by prayer and petition, present your requests to God. So we need to understand what it means to pray, to pray with one another in a Sunday service, to pray with one another in our homes, to pray and to say, will you pray for me? And to begin to see that God really wants us to grow and to mature. But so often we look to other ways and other means. And lastly, we see this good soil. Jesus describes a good and noble heart. A good heart makes time to hear the word of God and to retain it. He says, and by prayer and discussion, by reading books and by living it or persevering in it, there, has an, there is an integrity in the relationship with God and there's an integrity with others. And what does a good cr crop look like? I suppose I, I was thinking I could tell you about stories from Kilkenny and the work that went on in Carlow, and then the work that went on in Fermoy and Care. I could tell you about Don Donabate and uh, the planting that into Balbriggan and all of those churches. Those are good stories of the word of God going. I could tell you about a lady in our church with polio uh, who has now passed on to the Lord, a progressive condition that really was, took her away so that she couldn't walk and then had to go into a wheelchair and then she couldn't breathe properly so she had to have a neck brace a lady who went swimming two times or three times a week in her wheelchair in the bus. A lady who, who wrote creative poetry and talked about her relationship with God in that way. A lady who was a disability advocate and who was attendance at worship every Sunday and who had a deep joy and gladness in her life. Because this word went deep. And because she knew Jesus and she knew the hope that she had. That is what we're talking about. That is good soil. 
That is what Jesus wants to do. He does not want to take life away from us. He wants to give us life. He is a God of life and not of death. He is a God of hope. And that is what he wants. So the sinner is saved. The anxious grow uh, more peaceful. The unloving learn to commit. The distracted are focused. The addicted are free. And sinful destructive patterns are changed. Jesus has given us the secrets of the kingdom of heaven. If we hear the word, if we retain the word, if we persevere in the word, we will produce a crop. And that crop is to become more and more like Jesus and to know eternal life and to be able to live as he wants us to live. Let us be confident in Christ. Let us be confident in his word. And folks, we'll just respond, I think, to that. I see your time has gone over the hour, so let's just respond in singing. Now, I thank we all our God. And do talk to me about these things after the service and make yourself known as well. It'd be lovely to talk to you. Thank you. So let's stand to sing. Now, I thank we all our God. <laughs> And now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all now and forevermore. Amen.